this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. Today, we are getting you set for the return of NASCAR, talking with PJ Walsh of the Action Network about how he bets on NASCAR and some of his favorite bets for this weekend on Sunday. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Ed Feng. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com. Ed, we are back. Sports are back. We had UFC on Saturday, UFC again tonight. We have a bunch of NASCAR races coming up, so slowly dipping our feet back into the sporting waters. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, I mean, I, I really wanted to get out and watch the UFC. Well, not get out. I really wanted to watch the <laughs> UFC. Uh, couldn't find anyone to do it with. And I found it hard to say, hey, honey, happy Mother's yeah. Day Eve. Can we watch <laughs> some guys kick the crap out of each other? So that did romantic. happen. Um, and I was definitely reading up about it and caught some highlights later. But I really do regret not catching it live. Yeah. Because one of the benefits was that you could really hear every punch because yeah. there was no fans there and and i i couldn't find highlights in which i could really catch that and so i kind of you know regret not doing it live where you get the espn plus feed and um you know really really get the true action just because there's no fans and and the noise associated with it and i think that that's something that's gone kind of overlooked with like this discussion around having sporting events with no fans is like when you're at like a, a high school game you can hear every word the coaches say every right. word and you get to hear that and i feel like it's underrated how cool that is to hear yeah. all those factors um so i understand people you know are wary of the no fans thing but like it is pretty cool to have that additional experience i think the good thing for the ufc stuff is that that was the big card on saturday but we can still bet right. on the card on wednesday there's one coming up that's a little bit bigger on saturday too and i think that one's on espn proper I believe I could be totally wrong on that, but like we can watch this and, and get exposure to yep. it, get some action on it. And I think that having it without paying 70 bucks for it is, is enough to at least get me to like try it. Even though as mentioned last week, I'm pretty squeamish as a human being. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's definitely good to have some sports back and um, yeah, I know it's good to have these other events and then we're going to talk some NASCAR today. Yeah, indeed we are. We're going to talk with PJ Walsh. Uh, he is a writer and editor for the Action Network, we're going to discuss NASCAR's return on Sunday at Darlington. Uh, they also have a race on Wednesday at Darlington. They are then racing the following Sunday at Charlotte, and then Wednesday again at Charlotte. whole lot of NASCAR coming up. So we're going to talk to PJ about how to bet on NASCAR, some drivers he likes at FanDuel Sportsbook for this weekend, and more. If you want to get some UFC betting discussion uh, for the Wednesday card, if you listen to this right away, or on Saturday, we did have a broad discussion about UFC with Barry Cohen last week. So just go to the Covering the Spread podcast feed and, and hear where Barry gets his data, uh, what type of uh, what type of markets he likes most. All that stuff is at the beginning of that interview with Barry. So just search for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. And while you're there, please leave a rating and review as well because uh, those do help us out quite a bit. Uh, and then we'll have more stuff coming up in the coming weeks as well here on Covering the Spread. FanDuel Sportsbook is now available in Colorado. But what's a sportsbook with no sports? Well, it's FanDuel Anything Book. FanDuel's newest free game. Each day, you'll pick one free prop, like the weather, stocks, or anything. Pick it right to win 5 bucks in side credit, then play again tomorrow. Play FanDuel Anything Book free, only on FanDuel Sportsbook. Must be 21+, plus. max bonus $50. Visit FanDuel.com audio for terms. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700. Now, before we get to PJ, Ed, NASCAR's free. Can I get you to, to watch some NASCAR on Sunday with the sports hiatus? At what time is it on Sunday? It's at 3.30. All right. So I, I you think... you us, I'm going to jump in a little bit. I think we got to sell you on this and uh, right. get you into some NASCAR. Maybe we'll get PJ uh, to sell you as well. Uh, but I think that it's worth it just because I think that it'll fill the void a little bit at least. For sure. All right, so let's bring P.J. Walsh in. Again, he's a writer and editor at the Action Network. Find him on Twitter, at P.J. Walsh 24, talking some NASCAR for this weekend. Covering the present. 
Let's bring PJ Walsh into covering the spread. PJ, I appreciate you taking some time before what is going to be a crazy stretch uh, for betting on NASCAR. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm very excited for some real racing, so let's go. Have you dabbled in the iRacing stuff? I know you had some stuff up on the Action Network for it. Were you actually betting, playing any DFS for it to fill the time, or has this been just kind of like a, a down period for you? I did a lot of betting and a little DFS. Okay. A little DFS to frustrate me. Uh, enough <laughs> betting. The limits are so low. It, it was, you know, I, I was talking to some friends and, and, and other bettors. It was enough to whet your appetite sure. to kind of take the place of racing, but it's not real racing. No. So the limits were low, but it was fun. I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed betting on it, but I'm really excited for uh, real races, real limits, and, and a real sweat. And someone other than William Byron getting the win, which is always welcome for sure. So, PJ, we're going to start things off here because we haven't done too many NASCAR shows here in covering the spread. We had one before Daytona, but I think it's good to get just broad discussions around NASCAR because a lot of people listening probably have not bet NASCAR before and maybe looking to do so now that it's kind of, you know, one of the only shows in town. So what steps do you take before you lock in a bet for a specific race? Are you a data type person? Uh, what's your process looks look like uh, for betting on NASCAR? Yeah, I, I really like looking at historical results at the same track. Um, I like similar tracks, which may be a little different. So it's the, there's always the argument of the recent form versus historical data. I try to blend them as well. Like when we go to Charlotte next week, I'm going to look heavily on Vegas. But I don't really care about Vegas right now because I don't think a mile and a half with no fall off is going to be similar to Darlington with a ton of fall off. So um, I'll look at really the last three races at Darlington, but more emphasis on last year because of the new aero package. So, you know, we have a totally different car in, in 2019 and 2020 than we had 2018 going back. So I'm going to use that race. I'll use the first four races. Well, really the first three, three races this season. I don't care about Daytona because that just doesn't correlate to non-super speedway racing. So I'll use the first three races, not because I really want to, but it's, it's really all we have. <laughs> so there, there's so many unknowns, you know, no practice. We'll have a starting lineup, but no qualifying. So you don't even have to make a fast lap there. So I'm really going to look at the last couple of races at Darlington and then those first three races minus Daytona, or first four minus Daytona. And I think that the tough part there is kind of what you alluded to, where – there hasn't been a similar track, and I guess there isn't really a quote-unquote similar track to Darlington. But, like, let's right. say we had actual, like, data for this year. Which tracks would you put in that quote-unquote similar bucket to Darlington? Because I've always struggled with this personally when it comes to Darlington specifically. What do you deem as being similar to that track? Yeah, I go intermediate with tire fall off, And like you said, there's not, <laughs> right. there's not a ton – you know, there's not a 1.3 egg-shaped <laughs> mile an hour or, or oval. Unfortunately, ball, unfortunately. Right? Unfortunately not. Um, but I would go with, I think Homestead is probably the closest comp. This uh, this week they're using the same tire as Homestead. So that has a little bit of uh, correlation to Homestead. I'll use Auto Club a little bit just because the, the tire fall off is so big. Um, I'll also look at Chicago. I think those three are really the big um, that I care about. But there's not a lot, like you said. So this is this is one of those races where it's really going to hurt not to have practice. Because for me, and and I'll admit, my biggest flaw as a NASCAR better is I get caught up in practice. Is I'll have, yeah. I'll spend the whole week doing, you know, looking at historical results, current form. I'll have what I think is a really good, uh, you know, top forty, and then someone will catch fire in practice, and I'll 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 get caught in the wave of all the all the emotion and the hype. And Darlington is a track where, and specifically those high tire wear tracks where I found with this aero package, I think that the fall off uh, in practice correlates to the race. So the fast cars in practice are faster than the race. Remember Auto Club, Alex Bowman set the mm -hmm. world on fire in practice and dominated the race. Conversely, when we get to Charlotte, it may save me from myself a little bit because no practice. I'll have a good set of, uh, good set of rankings based on historical results and, and what happened at Vegas. And because there's no practice, I won't get caught up on you know, Martin Truex Jr. being the class of the field, although I probably should at, at, at Charlotte <laughs> yeah. when he goes there. So uh, it's tough. It, it really is going to be tough without practice this week, but that, that's the fun of it. And the odds makers don't have that information either. So that may actually give us an edge. So, PJ, there aren't a ton of bets that you can make for NASCAR, but you do have winners, top three, five, ten, and matchups. Is there a particular market that you like the most? I gravitate mostly towards futures outright winners just because the limits are there. 
you know, you can bet matchups and you can bet those props, but if you can get more than 250 down or even to win $250 on some of those. So they're more complimentary for me. My, my, my win loss statement is all going to be tied to if I hit the race winner and if I lose the race winner and do well in matchups and might, uh, you know, bite into the losses or conversely, uh, if I win and, and win some matchups, it, it tops it off a little bit, but it's really, uh, the outright winners, especially as you get into the weekend when the limits go up, that's what I gravi- uh, gravitate towards in betting. Yeah, absolutely. And it's uh, it's tough to find uh, a ton of markets with NASCAR, which is one of the frustrating things. But I, hopefully, you know, NASCAR, I think, has been making an effort to try to expand that. And hopefully we eventually get there. But it's definitely a frustrating point here. I want to go back to something you had talked about before a bit, PJ, was talking about balancing practice, current form, and track history. And... The issue that we have here for this weekend is that we don't have any practice prior to the race. So how does that alter your approach? Um, I I know that like you you kind of alluded to this before, but with no practice being there, how does that change your mindset as a better? Yeah, like this this week is it's so tough. Like we talked about before, because there's there's not a lot of a lot of data there. Conversely, the odds may be soft and. I don't think they're soft so far, but we'll see what happens in the weekend. But, you know, as a better, I am, I'm being more conservative this week than I think I would normally. Like we talked about if we just had a run of races and we had a better idea, maybe they, they're supposed to run Homestead and Atlanta, another tire fall off track. I forgot to mention, if we had that data plus auto club going into uh, Darlington and practice, yeah, that may be a hammer type of race because of the way practice correlates to, uh, to Sunday. So this week, You know, I'm really taking a conservative approach. I've played Chase Elliott 12 to one early just because he's been the best car this year. Um, I've I've taken Tyler Reddick as a long shot, but that's all I've got. I'm really waiting for the starting lineup tomorrow as well. Um, But I'm going to be conservative, see what happens on race day when limits go up. And then potentially on Wednesday, it'll be interesting because we've never had a full race worth of data three days before in similar conditions. Right. We always look at the second trip to a track, well, how did they run in the spring? Well, conditions in the fall or summer are so different than they are in the spring. The teams have gotten better. The cars have gotten better. The weather's different. Three days later, that may be the best data we've ever had. Conversely, the books are going to have it too, and the odds makers are going to have it as well. So I'll be conservative this weekend um, as much as I can with real racing back. You know, I say that now. We'll see right, Sunday right. morning uh, <laughs> after, after a couple of beverages are flowing at noon. And, the golf match is starting. Uh, we'll see if I'm able to, to be conservative. But the plan is to be conservative this uh, this race and then Wednesday be a little more aggressive based on the data we get. That sounds good. Uh, we'll also have some Xfinity and Truck Series races uh, sprinkled in two, starting with Xfinity and Darlington on Tuesday. Are you going to bet those series? And, and if so, how are they different than the Cup Series? Yeah, I really do like betting them. They're They're easier and more difficult if that makes any sense, they're easier in that the edges are there Mm -hmm. is if you know what you're doing, you follow it. The edges are there. The problem is that everyone else can see the edges. So it's more about being able to find out when the odds are opening as opposed to finding the driver to bet. I think people who bet the sport and and do it a lot, you know, who's going to be fast, you know, there's a lot of equipment changes too. So you'll have like the KBM trucks. They're owned by Kyle Busch and they're the best, uh, best equipment in the truck series. They'll have young drivers come in and they'll be swapping out. So the books may not know a name, but um, you want to bet him because he's in a KBM truck. So they'll open him 30 to one. But as soon as that line opens, it's eight to one. (laughs) So it's all about getting that line. And also after they go off the board for practice and qualifying, someone pops in practice. It's finding that opener right when they reopen after practice, because if you wait 15 minutes, it's gone. So the edges are there. And it's more about monitoring the market when they reopen than it is about finding the edge, which is different than cup. Yeah. And I think that with the Xfinity Series this year, it's been kind of fascinating to watch because there are so many guys who dominated last year and are just gone. Like, everyone graduated, effectively. So we've seen four new winners in four races. So I'm pretty pumped to see what happens on Tuesday on the Xfinity side. Uh, for the Cup Series, we, we've talked a little bit about the first four races this year. But we've also had a long layoff since those four races. So... Things are pretty interesting right now. How much weight are you going to put in what we saw those first four races, especially for teams like, you know, Hendrick Motorsports and Joe Gibbs Racing, where the performance we saw in those four races deviated from what we saw in 2019? I think that this, for me at least, is especially pertinent for Gibbs because they were so bad outside of Daytona. This is the question that's been driving me crazy for the last (laughs) 10 days as as I've seen, you know, odds popping up. 
because it's all we have, which is tough. And the reason I bet Chase Elliott is through the first four races, even if you remove Daytona, best driver rating, most fast laps, uh, most laps led. So he's been the best car. He hasn't won yet. He's been the best car. Um, but they've had this long two and a half month layoff, which is usually the layoff we see in the off season. Like you mentioned, what happens in November, they bring new stuff, they bring new cars, they have new technology for Daytona and then going forward. But for me, it's how much can they actually work on the cars? So that that's the hard part for me is there's a lot of smart people in the garage. I'm sure they're meeting constantly to talk about, okay, we were at Auto Club. That was a, a, a fall off track. What did we learn there that we can put into the car at Darlington? But do they have time to actually do that? Do they have time to get to the shop and, and update the car? So it's a very long non-answer to answer your question. I don't know. <laughs> I'm acting like those first three races mean something because it's it's all we have. And I don't I don't think they've had enough time to really get to the get to the shop and rebuild something from the ground up. They'll probably be able to tweak a little bit, but then also do you really want to throw something completely new at the car when you can't practice it? So I think what they're gonna do in this race is is they'll go safe. They're gonna go with what they thought was their best setup coming in. They'll use whether use the auto club or Vegas, throw it in there, see how they do, and then have the the second car at the shop getting ready to go to Darlington. Okay, what we learned on Sunday, Wednesday, let's put in something new. I think the other tough part about like the the early season schedule is trying to like figure out how we want to view guys in new equipment because like our sample on Matt Benedetto uh, with Wood Brothers is super small. We don't have a great read on him at this type of track. We don't know what to expect necessarily out of like Chris Busher. So I guess I, I want to spin it back to you with regards to those guys, t- drivers in new equipment. How are you kind of evaluating them based on those four races? Or are they just kind of people you want to take more of a wait-and-see approach on from a betting perspective? Yeah, to go, I've actually, my favorite bet right now is Tyler Reddick. I really like Tyler Reddick at this racetrack. And that's because of, I looked at Xfinity stats for him at this racetrack as well. I think this this track sets up really well for him in terms of uh, big fall-off. you got to run the wall. It's the same tire as Homestead, which he's really good at. He was really good here the last the last two years in the Xfinity Series. For DeBenedetto and Busher, it's tough. I feel better about Busher. He's continually gotten better. I think he's gone 17th, 13th, and 12th at Darlington the last three years. Um, he was good at Auto Club, solid Auto Club, top 20, top 15 cars. So he's more of someone, if matchups, we get more robust matchups you'll look at. Probably more of a DFS option, uh, maybe a top 10 if, if those markets open. To Benedetto is hard because I really love it. I think he's really talented, and I think that this this equipment's good for him. I just don't know, and I'm still a little I'm still a little gun shy from him. I had him at 300 to one to win Bristol in the fall last <laughs> yeah. year, and he lost the lead with 10 laps to go because a lap car Newman wouldn't get out of the way. So I think he's going to be good. He seems just in terms of of the odds movement, and from meeting even you know in, in the DFS community like you guys is a lot of people seem high on him. And I think he's going to be overvalued come race day. But Tyler Reddick's my guy. So if if he finds a way to win this race, you guys may not see me for a few months. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, PJ. So for the first four races back, the Cup Series won't have any practices prior to the race. Uh, you've talked about how you might overreact to practices. So do you plan to just crush it for these four races? <laughs> I I hope so. I always <laughs> hope so. I, I always hope to I always hope to crush it. You know and in NASCAR, I always it's so frustrating and and lovable at the same time because your bet is never over. You know, if yeah. you're betting NFL and you have a three point underdog, you bet them plus three and they're up forty to three with four minutes left, the game's over. You can turn off the TV. There's been a lot of situations where you have a seven to eight second lead. There's three laps to go. The caution comes out. They're at a wear track. Everyone has to pit, and it changes everything, right? So, it, you know, I plan to crush it, and the goal is always. Beat the market. Obviously, you want closing line value. You want to bet Chase at 12 and hope he closes at 6, and that gives you a better chance to, to fill out a better card. Yeah. Um, but my goal is always just to pick the fastest cars. If you have the guy who's leading with, you know, has the seven-second lead with five laps to go and the caution, the phantom caution comes out and he loses the lead on pit road and loses the race, you know, you got to throw your hands up and say that's just <laughs> that's just the nature of the sport. Yeah. So to answer your question, Ed, I'm hoping to crush it. I'm hoping to have – the guys up front late in the race and, and see, uh, you know, see, see how it ends and, and see where the chips fall. Um, so that's the goal. That's the goal yeah. always. Right. And I think this year's been perfect for what you were talking about because uh, in Daytona, Chris Busher wrecked with like five laps left. He was in one of those cautions. And then suddenly he's 
gunning for the win on the final lap because he is able to work his way back. And then in Las Vegas, they had that weird caution at the end where a bunch of people pit. D. Benedetto's running second with like two with on the final restart. And it's been kind of like you said, your bet's never dead no, no matter where we are. Yeah, yeah. They're just like most other sports you want to look at right when the race starts. So you want to bet the NFL. It's, I, I try not to focus so much on the result of, okay, I bet this on – Friday. Now it's Sunday right before kickoff. Do I still like this bet? You know, how did the market move? Do I would I still make this bet right now, or if I can get out of it? So apply that to NASCAR. And in NASCAR, even you know, we talk about fantasy, DFS, and betting. All you can do is pick the fastest cars at the best prices. After that, you can't control it in a one race sample, but you continue to do that in the long run, and you'll end up winning more than you lose. So that's always the goal. Now we have seven chances in eleven races to do that, so it's <laughs> going to be magnified a little bit more. You know, if you're right, you're right, and it's going to feel like you're a king. And if you whiff a few times, you're going to feel like a zero. But that's just the nature of the sport. All right, let's put it all together here, PJ. Uh, based on the odds at FanDuel Sportsbook, you already mentioned Tyler Reddick, who I believe is 110. Uh, any other drivers you're eyeing, whether it be at their win odds right now or looking for matchup bets at other sites and trying to find drivers who you think may be better than the market is expecting for them at Darlington? Yeah, Reddick's definitely one. I, I love him at the FanDuel price at 110, and he's one I'll definitely look to back uh, if top fives and top tens come out because you'll still be able to get you know, decent two-to-one maybe for a top ten, you, you know, bigger for a top five. So so Reddick's a big one, specifically group bets with him. I played Chase at a couple places early at 12-to-one. I really like him. Like I mentioned, he's been the best car this year. He just, you know, cautions come out at inopportune times. He's led the most laps, run the most fast laps. So I like Chase. This is a feel-type racetrack. And I think if if someone like Kurt Busch floats in the 25 to one range, he's been really good here and sneaky good this season. So he's another guy I'm looking forward to. Then for those top guys, it, it's tough because we don't know where they're going to start. So yeah, it's tough to pass here. We don't really know how it's, you know, how it's going to race. So it's going to be tough to take someone like you know, Kyle Busch or Harvick, and then they got to start 11th. But if they're starting first or second and the odds don't fluctuate too much, that's when I'll probably move on those uh, on those top tier guys once we find out uh, starting position. It also feels like it's tougher to get behind guys with shorter odds just because there's so much uncertainty heading into this weekend. Like the first lap they run on the track is going to be under green flag conditions, and there's going to be rust. I mean, like I feel like we're, we're expecting too much to not expect rust. So at least from my perspective, it'd be hard to bet those guys regardless, just because the odds are so short for them. Are you having a similar hesitancy just because there's so much unknown getting behind a driver at a short number? Yeah, I find myself, you, you nailed it on there, looking more towards a long shot in that middle tier. You know, if, if Eric, someone like Eric Jones floats into that mid-25 range, look at him. I really like Alex Bowman for the same reason I like Chase. He's been really fast this year and was the dominant car at a, at a tire fall-off track like Auto Club. So you're right. It, it is hard to bury your card this early on one of those drivers up front. And we really don't know how they're going to race. To me, it makes sense. They're going to say, listen, guys, in the driver's meeting where they're all going to get together, we, we have a competition caution at lap 30. Let's go easy. Let's let everyone save their stuff. Let's all just kind of fall in line unless you're so much faster and you can make a clean pass. Let's everyone take their time, um, hang out, wait till lap 30, because from what I've read, I don't think that they can actually – make passes at lap 30 as long as you beat the pace car out you can make big adjustments to your car so i can see the first 30 laps everyone kind of hanging out in line then the big adjustments are going to come they're going to get back on the track and then they'll probably get turned loose and we'll see some real racing there so at that point to me i'm going to want the guys who are starting up front uh starting first second and third because i don't think there's going to be a lot of passing they'll get the adjustments then they'll have the clean air and some of the race will be gone will already be gone so yeah, it's tough to bury your car on those favorites. I'll, I'll admit that. Um, I'm sure I will once uh, <laughs> once we get to race day. I'm sure I'll find a way to do it. But right now, I'm, I'm really focusing on that middle tier and the longer shot, guys. Yep, absolutely. That is PJ Walsh. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at PJ Walsh 24 and check out his work at the Action Network as well. PJ, we appreciate the time. Good luck uh, to you and your liver over the next uh, couple of weeks. <laughs> and hopefully we can talk to you again soon. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Covering the future. One final big thank you to PJ Walsh of the Action Network for swinging by and talking some NASCAR. Ed, have we convinced you yet that NASCAR is worth your time on Sunday? 
Yeah, well, listening to PJ was great. And I definitely, you know, while he was talking about his bets, I uh, exercised my NASCAR expertise, which involves clicking on the link to check out the <laughs> odds at FanDuel Sportsbook. And I could see that Chase Elliott is eight and a half to one now. So um, PJ got him at 12 to one. Definitely some closing line, uh, some some proper market movement Yeah. Um, for what he's saying. So, uh, so yeah, so I think it, it's going to be interesting. I'm hoping to get some of mine. So let's move to covering the future as well, because I'm kind of hoping for some closing line value here and discussing someone we talked about with PJ a little bit. That's Matt Benedetto, And I may be buying into the hype that he alluded to, but it's still early in the season, which means that sports books may not be fully accounting for the changes that were made in the offseason. That's kind of why I want to go here to Matt Benedetto, because of the drivers who changed teams this year, I would argue the biggest one was Matt Benedetto going from Levine Family Racing to Wood Brothers Racing, where he gets access now to Penske Racing Equipment. That is Joey Logano, Brad Keselowski, Ryan Blaney, three of the fastest drivers in NASCAR so far this year. That's way different than where Di Benedetto was previously. We should have been looking to buy into him early in the season, and it almost would have paid off. As mentioned with PJ, uh, Di Benedetto finished second in Las Vegas partly due to some late-race late, late race strategy, but he was picking his way forward before that as well. He had a top 14 average running position in all three races outside of Daytona so far this year, and that's even with some luck working against him at times in that span. Now, Di Benedetto is going to a track where he had an awesome run last year while still in bad equipment. He had a 14th place average running position in that race and finished eighth. Now, we get that equipment upgrade. And the guy who was in this car last year finished ninth in that race, one spot behind Di Benedetto. So the car has top 10 upside. Di Benedetto himself has shown that he can do that himself in bad equipment. And I think that the biggest lingering question is whether or not he has the upside for a win. And I think that that is the biggest legitimate mark against Di Benedetto because he was close in Bristol last year, couldn't quite close the deal, didn't get it done in Las Vegas. But I think that with this speed and talent combination, that upside is at least there. And I'm willing to potentially buy in a little bit too early in order to get him at 50-1. to 1. He's 50-1 to 1 right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. Um, so I think that's a good number for Di Benedetto for this weekend's race at Darlington. FanDuel Sportsbook also has early odds posted for the Coca-Cola 600 in Charlotte next Sunday. And in that one, Di Benedetto is 75-1. to 1. And if we're talking closing line value... The odds that Di Benedetto closes that race at 75 to 1, given that there are two races before then, both in Darlington, where I think he could do well, the odds that he closes at 75 to 1 are minimal at best. So I think Di Benedetto is going to perform well in these two Darlington races. So I am fine betting him at 50 to 1 for Sunday or at 75 to 1 for the following Sunday. You can also get Ryan Blaney at 28 to 1 for that Coca Cola 600 race. So. I think that now would be a good time to check out those Coke 600 odds because they're interesting and a lot of them are potentially longer than they should be. So if we're going to sell you on NASCAR, Ed, we've got plenty of opportunities going forward to try to do so. That sounds good. I mean, do you have any sense for like just the variance in the performance in terms of some guys having more variance and others less? Or, you know, I mean, you talked about how DiBenedetto didn't, hasn't finished, but that could just be randomness and exactly. bad luck, right? Exactly. Because I think the other thing, too, is we were talking about that with regards to upside. He hasn't been in position to, to show the ability to clo close a race all that often in his career because his equipment's been so bad. And right. we've only seen him once in that position so far this year, and he finished second. Like, you know, that's not that far off from what we're talking about with a win. So... I would feel safer. Like, FanDuel Sportsbook doesn't have top 10 finishes or top 5 finishes posted yet or podium finishes. I think that those might be better markets for him. But I think even in, in the winner's market, there is viability there. And I think that, Ed, what you asked is a pertinent question because even a full season of NASCAR is a small sample. It's 36 races. So we talk about small samples for NFL, and those are smaller at 16 games. But NASCAR is also pretty small at 36 races. So I think... Talking about sample sizes is relevant here, too, because we really don't know, and especially for Di Benedetto, the sample on him in relevant equipment is four races. So I think that's a good question to ask. Yeah, for sure. And and it's like not it's like the variance in the results, right? Which is right. pretty hard to pin down, even right. if you do have a big sample size. Exactly. 
So um, I think that he's interesting for sure, and we'll know a lot more about his upside, I think, after these two races. But even it's, when you can get him 75-1 to 1 for Charlotte, I'd lock that in for sure. Uh, let's finish things up here with Quarantine Corner for this week, Ed, as we have now passed uh, 50 days uh, since the NBA was shut down. I think we're at like eight or nine weeks now. I've lost count. We have it up on our chalkboard uh, in our kitchen, how many days it's been. So I haven't oh, yeah. it in a bit, so I've lost yeah. count. But uh, what's your quarantine corner for this week? Yeah, so I'm going with Afterlife. It's a Netflix series, and I probably would have never clicked on it, except it was written by Ricky Gervais. Oh. And I think I've talked about how amazing Ricky Gervais is. Uh, his stand-up special, Humanity, is, is just side-splittingly funny. And the thing I like about Afterlife is that it is both very serious. So he plays a a man who has just lost his wife and his love of his life to cancer. And he's dealing with that and he's thinking about suicide and, you know, it makes you think about some very serious things. Yeah. So for example, he's talking to a guy and he's like, well, have you ever, have you ever thought about committing suicide? And the guy says, well, suicide would be too good for me. It just kind of makes you just, it's just kind of shocking. It makes you think about life versus death and, and a lot of things. But the other thing is it is just, hilarious because it's Ricky Gervais and it's not like every episode isn't really hilarious but I nearly crap myself watching the last episode um both my wife and I have really been getting into it um so it's for me it's like a good mix of you know serious versus comedy versus um you know it kind of reminds me of like the best literary fiction that I like um with the humor and the seriousness and death and 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 concepts like that. So Afterlife on Netflix, a uh, Ricky Gervais show. It's so hard to like do both well. Uh, so I think yes. that hearing that the show does that is interesting. For you, in what's kind of been like a weird time, have you found yourself gravitating more towards comedy as like a release? Or how have you been kind of doing that from like a, a media consumption perspective? How are you handling that? Yeah, Um so it always tends to be the time of year where I tend to engage in comedy more, yeah. partially because it is the off season, uh, partially because I would like my content to be less serious and a little <laughs> bit more funny. So I'm, I tend to think about that stuff. Um, I don't know if it necessarily has anything to do with the pandemic. Sure. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think there's a lot of, a lot of ways to, to deal with that. But one thing I do want to mention, like, you know, like I'm reading Gravity's Rainbow right now by Thomas Pynchon, and and most people think it's like a very serious. It's a very hard book. Like if you if you cut if you got asked anybody, it's really hard. But it's also one of the most hilarious things I've ever encountered. Yeah. And I think it, you know that that's not like it, it's not something you really talk about with like serious books, but it really is freaking hilarious. Um, and uh, so that, I mean, is probably the biggest way in which uh, I've you want kind the of balance. engaged. You want the balance. Yeah, into... like, I mean, okay. that book is great because it's a balance, right? Yeah. Like, it's really comedic, but also very serious about uh, it's set in World War II. And, you know, he's he's in Germany right after uh, the Allies win. And it's, mm -hmm. it's basically a free-for-all. So yeah. it's comedic in some sense that way in which he's just interacting with all these people. And there's... There's no rules, and it's it's very serious in terms of like you know sure. what, what is our role in life, and can we do anything against they and and yeah. the machine and um you know the industrial military complex, but it's also just side splittingly funny. I'm sure I'm sure my family's like what what the, what, the, what are you reading over there? <laughs> and I think that's very characteristic of some of my favorite books ever, yeah. and it's also very characteristic of Afterlife. It's 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 not always funny, but yeah. when it's funny, it's just uh, it makes you laugh in a way, you know, it's kind of timeless too. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, Gravity's Rainbow was written in like 1970, whatever. And to still make you laugh however later is, is, you know, you know, and for me, like, you know, my jokes are about, <laughs> I don't know. They're just not as funny. They're just not as timeless. Right. Yeah. So, um, I, I think it's, it's good to appreciate, uh, you know, how the best have done comedy. Yeah. And blending those two is so tough. Uh, but I think that when you can do it, it makes the comedy even better if you can properly blend those two things. Right. And I think that's kind of relevant for my quarantine corner because uh, it's it's actually a podcast. But if you've watched The Wire, which I desperately hope you have. Actually, I think PJ <laughs> mentions in his Twitter bio that he hasn't. We should have asked him about this. Uh, but right. um, 
The Ringer is doing a podcast, which is recapping every episode of The Wire. It's with Jamel Hill oh, wow. and Van Lathan. It's called Way Down in the Hole. And it's fun to just go back and listen to like deep dives on every single episode throughout the series. Because I watched The Wire for the first time way too late in life, honestly. Like I should have watched this right. a very long time ago. Uh, but it was my first fall working with Number Fire. My coworker, Brandon Gadula, said, hey, you should watch this show. And I tore through it in like two weeks and i've like rewatched it since then and like it's my favorite show i've ever seen and now they have this podcast which goes deep into every episode they discuss you know uh what's important uh coming from that the themes that can come out of it and uh they pull audio from it uh because hbo is an investor in the ringer so i think they have rights to the audio and all that um sure so it's been fun to listen to that and they actually release the podcast really quickly because i consume a lot of podcast content um so i need a lot of content but they pump them out pretty quickly so if you watch the wire or are currently watching the wire given that the hbo i think they have like some weird free trial uh to watch it i'd recommend checking out this podcast maybe not if you've never seen the wire before because they do allude to things that happen later in the series i can't say spoil things because it was released in the early 2000s but I would recommend it if you are a fan of The Wire. Uh, it's a great podcast, but also um, they had a book about The Wire uh, two years ago. It's called All the Pieces Matter. I forgot who the author of that was, but um, looking it up now. Um, <laughs> Wasn't John, David Simon that wrote it? or it was Jonathan Abrams. Else? Jonathan oh, yeah. Abrams wrote it, but David Simon like talked to him for it. Uh, okay. but I'd really recommend that too. So if you're a fan of the wire first, read all the pieces of matter by Jonathan Abrams, and then check out way down in the hole by, uh, Jamel Hill and Van Lathan. Have you watched the wire? I've yeah. seen, I think two of the seasons. I remember the season where they went into the schools. Yeah. It was like Mr. Presbolewski. Is yeah. that his name? Yep. Presbo. Um, yeah, it was amazing. I mean, what, what he was able to do and yeah. to take you into a world like that. And what what I believe to be a pretty authentic way is is a remarkable accomplishment. And yeah, um, yeah, no, I mean I think it's widely considered one of the best shows ever made, right? And and I I, and I there's definitely some seasons like I I missed the drug bazaar season. Yeah. Um, so what, there are five seasons. Five total seasons. Uh, yeah. There's the opening one. There's one on the docks on season. Uh, season two is about the docks. Season three is about like corporate political power uh season four right. is about uh the schools season five is about uh journalism which i thought was interesting uh but yes, season seen, four season five, yeah. my sister taught in baltimore uh oh, when wow. she came out of college and she watched that season and like confirmed that it's like very accurate so i think that that's the interesting thing is they do right. portray things well and delicately balance all of the the gray area involved with everything you know nothing's black and white and they portray that that gray area so well so i think we need to, your homework can be watching all of the wire the entire <laughs> series before next week uh that's gonna be pretty hard yeah <laughs> i might but, i may choose to spend the time doing sports analytics instead <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't it be nice if there was sports well, yeah, no. analyze? no well i'd like to i mean i mean there's always work to be done for next football season yeah so um but yeah, no, I mean, it's been interesting for me because it's like I don't have a ton of time sure. um, to, you know, to do all these things. So, um, no, but I think my wife would be my wife would get into a, a season of The Wire. I think so. Um, it's it's like it's another show that like doesn't do comedy often, but when they do, they nail it. Um, right. So I think that it, it doesn't really it's probably not as comedic as a Ricky Gervais show. But like when they do do it, they do it well when they choose to do it. And it's a, it's a great show. So I would recommend it for sure. And again, the podcast is way down in the hole. And that's the one I've been listening to recently. Ed, that's all we got for today. What's going on for you over at the Power Rank? Yeah, the Power Rank is where I usually put sports analytics on the internet. <laughs> Hasn't been much of that, but uh, definitely starting to do some work, getting ready for next season. And uh, just, if you want to stay up to date with that, uh, go to thepowerrank.com, sign up for my free email newsletter. And then I'm on Twitter at the Power Rank. All righty, that is Ed. I am at Jim Sanes, J I M S A N N E S. We have a lot of DFS stuff actually this week because we have 
uh, NASCAR podcast for your DFS coming up tomorrow, uh, and then a UFC podcast with Austin Swain coming up on Friday to preview Saturday's card. You can get those by subscribing to the Number Fire Daily Fantasy podcast feed, and then NASCAR podcast two next week as well. So a lot of stuff coming up on the DFS side of things. Uh, You can find that by searching for the Number Fire Daily Fantasy podcast feed. Subscribe there and also subscribe to Covering the Spread while you are there. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald. He is our video producer for uh, coordinating the video side of things and shopping up the clips for the FanDuel Twitter account. Thank you, Cal, as always. Thank you to PJ Walsh for swinging by and talking NASCAR. Find him on Twitter at PJWalsh24. And thank you to all of you for tuning in once again this week to talk some NASCAR. Back again soon here on Covering the Spread. Until then, good luck with your bets. Stay safe. We'll talk to you again soon. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs>